I want to thank you all all for being here this evening, this public information meeting on the, um, to discuss the specifics uh, of the Buxton Renourishment Project and, of course, the new Avon Beach Nourishment Project. Uh, and good news is they are scheduled for this summer. So uh, we're looking very, very forward to that. Just to let everyone know, this meeting is being live streamed tonight. So I'd like to uh, welcome those uh, who are turning in virtually right now this evening. I hope we got a good crowd doing that as well. Following our presentations, we'll have a question and answer period. I'll ask the county manager to come up and uh, take questions and answers. And if you're attending virtually, let me just uh, ask you to submit any question that you have to Dare County PR at darenc.com. Once again, if you're attending virtually, Dare County PR at darenc.com. I'd like to make a few introductions um, in attendance uh, with uh, us this evening. And um, I want them to stand and come forward if they would. And that's my fellow commissioners, the Vice Chairman Overman. Vice Chairman Overman, would you come forward? And, um, Commissioner House, Steve House, Steve. Commissioner Herb Bateman. And where's my man Danny? At Danny Couch. Danny's in here somewhere. I saw you walk in the door. You're trying to hide from me, aren't you, boy? Guys, folks, we are fortunate to have these folks on our board. The vision of Dare County Board of Commissioners is just phenomenal. And I can't thank my fellow commissioners enough for the job that they do and their time and commitment in their effort, all the, all the things that we've been able to accomplish. All this is due to your credit, guys. I, I thank you for that. Thank you for being here with us. <clears throat> we also have some staff with us this evening. I mentioned earlier that at the end of the meeting, our county manager will come up and, and uh, host some uh, questions and answers. But Our county manager and county attorney, Bobby Alton, is here with us this evening. I believe our finance director's here, Mr. Clawson. There's Dave back there. We, we couldn't do this without him. He's got the money and the brains to get all this stuff done to help us make it happen. So, Dave, thank you for being here. Um, public information officer, Ms. Hester, her, her, her and her staff have put all this together to make it happen here this evening. Um, where's Dustin? Dustin Peel is here. He's our project manager. Uh, our IT director, Matt Hester's back there. Matt, he he's, uh, helps us with all of this IT stuff and makes it work for us. Uh, Brad Daniels and Charlie Burris with Current TV, they're here this evening. And Fedison Center, uh, Karen Groggins, Karen's here with us this evening. So I mentioned earlier, uh, this facility is, every time I come here, that just the uh, the maintenance of this place and the, and the way it looks is just phenomenal. They do a great job here. Also have with us this evening is um, Superintendent Halleck with our National Park Service. And I'm going to ask the Superintendent Halleck to make a, some comments a little bit later on in, in, our, in our meeting. Um, and I, uh, Dave, if he's got some staff here along with him, he'll introduce those folks. Um, Coastal Science. We are fortunate to have Coastal Science uh, work with us. We've worked with them for a number of years now. And, um, and Hai Ching is here this evening, and she's going to come forward and, and uh, speak to us and talk to us about that. She's the project engineer and manager. And I can't thank you enough, Hai Ching, for all the work that you and your staff and your company do for us. It's incredible. Uh, Steve, I don't know if I must pronounce Steve's last name right, Trainin, Trainin. Steve is the uh, CSE project manager, and uh, we also have Ian Emerson is with CSI. He's, a, he's an engineer and assistant with uh, CSI. 
I think we have some contract uh, uh, contractors here from uh, Great Lakes uh, uh, Company. Uh, is Armand real here? There's Armand right there. Armand, thank you. I didn't get a chance to speak to you before the meeting, but uh, Armand's the vice president and senior project sponsor for the southeast region for the Great Lakes. And, uh, and uh, it ain't their first rodeo, folks. They know what they're doing. It's just going to be phenomenal. Uh, these projects and the accomplishment that, that we're going to take place this summer. These projects are so, so important. Why? Because of severe disruption that's caused by flooding that occurs highway right outside of this building in Avon and Buxton. It's not, it not only impacts the health and safety of the residents who live here, but also affects our economy here on the island. That's why our Board of Commissioners has stepped up to the plate, and I said this earlier when they were up here, we have stepped up to the plate um, for a number of years now. We're approaching what, county manager now, 120, $130 million in beach nourishment projects. I mean, that's incredible. No other county that's uh, doing that throughout the state, North, North Carolina. Knowing that the federal government and the state were not going to do anything, our board took on the task. It's a team effort. There's been many, many people and agencies involved to secure the necessary permits and make sure we're on track for a successful project this summer. And I want to thank every one of you that I've mentioned your names here tonight. I want to thank you for the part that you played in that because it is critical. It's critical for our businesses, our residents on this island. We have got to protect our homeowners and our businesses. At this time, I'd like to ask Superintendent Halleck to come forward and uh, offer some remarks. But before you do, Dave, I want to thank you personally. You, you, uh, you have been a, become a very close personal friend of mine over the years, the last seven years. And I can't thank you enough for your attitude, your leadership, just your responsiveness to our citizens. And most importantly, uh, I'm able to call you my friend. And I appreciate all that you do for the Park Service down here on the island. So, Dave, would you come forward and uh, I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to be here tonight and uh, a pleasure to work with uh, Dare County on this project and many others. I just wanted to give a little background. Uh, I think it was 20, 2015, Dare County had proposed to do a beach nourishment project here in Buxton. And uh, when big project like that. I think it was a 20 to $25 million project, Dave. Did I get that about right? Um, when a big project like that is done, the, the government has to prepare an environmental review, something that's usually like this. And so it took us 18 months. We worked with uh, CSE and many others, and we wrote a really thorough environmental assessment. And we decided to allow the beach nourishment project to occur at Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Great effort, but we were exhausted when it was over. And while we were doing it, we said, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could do a programmatic review of these projects so that in the future, if the county or DOT or other partners want to implement a beach nourishment project, we'll have performed the review and we'll be able to much more quickly respond and consider issuing a permit. So that's actually exactly what we did. We did one document. Um, this is the uh, sediment Management Framework, Final Environmental Impact Statement, and Dare County and many others were partners in this. And what we did is we looked at all of the reasonably likely beach nourishment areas at the seashore from South Nags Head all the way to the tip of Ocracoke Island and made a decision that we would allow some form of beach nourishment under certain conditions, the same conditions that the county is already working under in the future, uh, without the need to write another 200 page volume to be on somebody's shelf somewhere. Um, so it was a pleasure working with the county on that. And that is the environmental review that allows and these two projects to happen and the review under which we issued the Avon and the Buxton permit. So 
Uh, we'll be working very closely with the county during this project. The last project was very successful. Our staff were meeting with CSE and others every week. Everything from relocating turtle nests to keeping the public safe went exceptionally well. And uh, we're confident that will happen again. So thank you for the opportunity to make some comments, Bob, and be here. And I'm happy to answer questions with Bobby uh, later if they come up. Thank you, Dave. Along those lines, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. I think it's important to mention this, and you folks are certainly aware of this. Uh, a number of months back, not only nourishment, but we know that NC-12 is a huge issue from the time you come across the Oregon Inlet Bridge hidden this way, that we knew that we had some major spots in, on 12 that down the road in the future could be a major problem for us. And NCDOT doesn't have a long-term plan. So um, I asked uh, uh, County Manager and, and uh, Superintendent Halleck to be a part of a task force. With, we've got a number of other agencies involved in a task force, and we're close to uh, making some recommendations, the subcommittee, to the task force on uh, the hot spots from 12 uh, from the bridge, all uh, uh, Bass Knight Bridge, all the way uh, south. So hopefully, um, once we uh, make those uh, 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 priorities set, then we can uh, start on working on how to uh, to mitigate them. So I thought it was important to at least uh, mention that NC12 uh, task force. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask um, representatives from Coastal Science to come forward and make their presentation. And Hai Ching, I'm sure. That's, uh, you're going to spearhead that for us. So thank you, Haji. Come forward. Thank you, Chairman Woodard. Good evening. It's good to be here. And I prepare a few slides. First, we will have an overview of this uh, 2022 project and I'm going to give you the design of the nourishment and uh, let you know what we are permitted to do. Then, if you have been here for five years, so you know we had a fish nourishment project. I forgot how short I am. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, so in 2017, we did this uh, box nourishment project. We certainly accumulate some experience and learn some valuable lessons during that construction. So I will give uh, you a review of that project and then we will go through the schedule and uh, the preparation before construction and uh, what you expect during construction. So as our Chairman Woodard said, um, I'm not going to preach to the choir because you all know how important this project is. So one thing I want to point is that the main purpose of this project is to protect Highway NC Highway 12. And another thing I want to point is um, this FEMA. How this FEMA? Why we put this FEMA sign there? After this uh, 2017 Buxton project, Buxton project area became eligible for FEMA's restoration funds. What do that funds do to community? If a community or ocean ground community has an engineer beach through either trucking operation or offshore dredging beach nourishment and put if the funds are from a local government, not from the federal, that makes that coastal community eligible for FEMA's um, restoration funds. So if there is a declared disaster in this area, then this area could, based on the survey, and if this area proves that they have lost the sand during this uh, declared disaster, and FEMA could reimburse this uh, coastal community for the sand loss to restore this uh, sand loss. So this is what this funds for. Because Buxton had this uh, initial nourishment in 2017, so Buxton became eligible for the, this FEMA funds. 
uh, sure enough, after this 2017 project, two hurricanes impacted the Buxton project area. Hurricanes of Florence in 2018 and Hurricane Doran in 2019. And the FEMA evaluate our survey data and approve the county's application for these uh, re restoration funds. So this time, FEMA is going to reimburse, well reimburse the county about $8 million, and this $8 million will go into this Buxton renourishment project. The same hurricane, hurricanes uh, Florence and Doran, impacted Avon area as well. But since Avon wasn't nourished, was not an engineer beach, so Avon was not qualified, was not eligible for this FEMA funds. So one of the purpose and goals of this Avon nourishment that we will do in 2022, summer 2022, is that Avon will become eligible for future FEMA restoration funds. And um, Superintendent Halleck already showed you this uh, final environmental impact statement. I just can't thank NPS enough for doing this. After 2017, some forerunners of NPS led by Superintendent Halleck, they projected that this kind of nourishment or some kind of a beach rest restoration projects will be needed for this area. So they developed this uh, document and uh, this uh, joint record of decision was issued in May 2021, just right in time before we submitted our uh, um, permit application for Avon and Buxton. What we propose to do in Avon and Buxton is consistent with their programmatic uh, sediment management plan. They have this 20-year plan. That is really foresee what would happen in for the, over the next 20 years. So what we propose is consistent with their plan. And not only those documents not only help Avon and Buxton receive permits in an efficient way, in a timely manner, but I believe time and again, they, those documents will prove its value in the future whenever we need uh, some uh, beach restoration projects in the future. And some uh, permits we received this uh, uh, January 13th, uh, that's uh, right before uh, David, Mr. Clausen went to the LGC for the funding. So everything we receive in time, just like the county's uh, schedule. Um, I know um, some homeowners and the residents, so you came here with your questions, and some gentlemen already asked me some questions about our design. And some of my answers, I will go back to the permit and let you know what we are allowed to do during this uh, nourishment and what's what is outside of the scope of work that we propose in the permits. So if it's outside of the scope, we cannot do it this time. Um, maybe in the future we can plan for that, but we are only allowed to do what the permits um, given us to do. So um, this is the sixth beach nourishment using offshore sediment source in their county. And all of the previous um, five projects occurred in summer. So why summer dredging is uh, so important? So you, I show you this um, monthly average wave height. There are two lines. The top line, the dark black line, represents diamond shoals. That's what you have in Hatteras Island. It's a little bit further south of uh, Buxton, but that represents what Hatteras Island wave climate. And uh, this uh, green line represents for the 60 miles uh, north of uh, Hatteras Island at this uh, dock field research center. You can see even within Deer County from north to south, the waves that you have here, generally speaking, are two, one to two feet higher. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
higher than what the northern towns experience. And this four months, May to, from May to August, you have the lowest average wave height. That's why summer dredging is so critical in this area. And this red line represents the maximum wave height for safe dredging, and that is based on hopper dredges. That's what uh, Great Lakes, our contractor this time, plan to use. If you use a cutter head dredge, this red line has to move even further down, maybe four, three to four feet of wave, then really limit the construction windows even further. So this slide pretty much show that summer dredging is critical. That's the only way it can be done safely and efficiently in this area. So here is a map that what we propose to do. The owner of this project is Deer County. No federal money except for FEMA's money is involved. And we have um, contractor Great Lakes, and we, CIC, is the engineer. Here is the Avon, and here is the Buxton. There is a 1.6 miles between Avon and Buxton that will not be nourished. This is a national seashore area, and the total volume is 2.2 million cubic yards, and those shaded, the blue boxes, are the offshore borrow area. Sand will be dredged from these areas, and then the dredge will carry the sand and get about one mile offshore and the pump sand onto the beach from there. And Great Lakes will use the hopper dredging, and then the total cost of this 2.2 million cubic yards project, including mobilization, is um, almost $26 million. And if we include mobilization, demobilization, and the pumping cost, the equivalent unit cost is $11.70 per cubic yard. The construction schedule is from May to August 2022. And this time, this estimate is consistent with uh, what their county has uh, put on their website. Now we say that Avon the Buxton got a really good deal. While we say that, here is this uh, construction cost analysis. This number, $11.76 per cubic yard, is what you're going to get for Avon and Buxton this time. And we, put, we plot together this, uh, we choose some projects that with a similar setting, using offshore borrow area with a similar scale, similar uh, dredging and uh, pumping method, so we compare this price. Uh, we did a least squares regression analysis of those numbers, and we plotted a trend line. You see, what we have, this is from 2016 to 2021. What we have here is a significantly lower than what this uh, trend line projected. So that means we are really below the market price. And see, this one is your, another local project that is uh, planned to start the same season, summer 2022. And your A1 and Buxton project is about $6 per cubic yard less than your other local project. What does it mean? That means with the same budget, you are going to get more sand the reason, one of the reasons we got this extremely good, favorable price is uh, you, you got to thank to your board, your chairman board of commission, chairman of the board of uh, commissioners and the commissioners for making the timely decision of uh, combining Avon and the, and the Buxton project together. Among that $26 million construction cost, take a guess how much is the mobilization cost for bringing these two, those two dredges here. 
That mobilization cost is a seven point six million dollars. Out of this, twenty six million dollars. So if they didn't make the decision for combining these two projects, you you are looking this would be much higher than the eleven dollars seventy six cents. So your commissioners, your leaders of this area, know what they are doing, and they understand the dredging market. So that's why you're going to have a project that's with the best cost, and then you receive the most volume within your budget. And now we separate Avon nourishment and the box of renourishment and see what exactly we plan to do along Avon and Buxton. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, uh, Avon. Avon project uh, starts from uh, this Dune East Road and all the way to the last house of Avon. The total project length is uh, 2.5 miles. We divided this 2.5 miles into two regions based on the volume analysis, based on how much sand you need to restore your beach. So we, north of the pier, we call it Reach 1, and south of the pier, we call Reach 2. In the next slide, I will show um, along Reach 1 and Reach 2, we will have different design because your volume needs in that area. And this is the borough area and hopper dredging. The construction schedule is May to August and the contractor plans to nourish, to start nourishment along Avon first. So the first dredge will start. I will save those slides for, for uh, Amount. Well, he will give you more details. And some people ask whether this project will start from north, go south, or from south to north. Neither. They will start from somewhere in the middle and flip north and south, and then shift to another landing point and finish the project. So Amount will go through the schedule in more details. So here is a typical design along those two ridges. The northern ridge, north of Avon Pier, the average fuel density is 43 cubic yards per foot, and the typical initial berm width will be 100 feet. So right after construction, you will see that your dry sand beach will be 100 feet wider, but this is just an initial berm width. That's why I underscore that initial. What will happen is that the initial berm will be adjusted immediately after the contractor place the berm because the waves will overtop the berm and shift some sand seaward and form a more natural beach topography. The right line represents what we design and what the contractor will do during construction. You will have a flat berm and a relatively steeper slope, but natural will bring some sand under the water and form a natural slope. So if we design this, and then the contractor would cost more money to really mimic the natural slope, but the natural, the waves can do it for us. So we, instead of uh, building a natural slope, we will build an initial berm and then the wave will do the rest of the work. And for this area, the initial adjustment would occur the most uh, during the first few months after nourishment. And then we expect the final adjustment would uh, would be completed within a year or two in this area. So this uh, north of the Avon Pier section will not have an initial dune. The reason is that you already have relatively healthy dune along this section, along this 4,000 feet section. So that's why the dune is not needed there. Instead, we put the most we put all the volume on your beach 
so that you can re achieve the widest speech within the template, within the volume. For south of the Avon Pier, the same elevation of the dry sand berm, this a plus 7 NAVD is a, about 7 feet above mean sea level. It is uh, the elevation that what, what, what you see, the dry sand beach. So that's a natural beach. We're not going to build a higher beach, um, but it's about the, what you see there. It's just a wider. And south of the pier, we plan to build a dune because a dune is needed to start um, an initial dune. And then what this a white beach, over the time, wind will do the rest of work. Wind will blow the sand and the deposit on top of the dune and make the dune base wider. This is what we have seen in other areas in, along the outer banks. And your wind is so much stronger than South Carolina or other places. And that's why I rest rather at their first flight here because you have wind here. And wind will do good for us, for the dune. They will pick the sand and build the dune. The same for the northern ridge and will, do, will make the dune base wider. So this is a typical design of Ava. And after, uh, some people ask about sand fencing and the vegetation, Great Lakes will, be, will do, only do the nourishment. And the county has already secured another, sub, another contractor, and they will do the sand fencing and the vegetation after they finish the nourishment. And sand fencing and vegetation will not start and after November 16th. That's because of turtle nesting season. November 15th is the last day of a turtle, sea turtle nesting season. So after that, the contractor of uh, the sand fencing and vegetation can come in and finish that portion of work. Once we have that um, schedule, we will let uh, Ms. Hester know, and then she can post it on your website. This is a Buxton renourishment project. 2.9 miles of the project length. Um, this, uh, we, similar to A1 project, we have two, two reaches. Reach one is uh, in front of uh, the village of Buxton. It's a short reach. And the rest, the, two, the other two thirds of the project is along National Seashore. The total volume is 1.2 million cubic yards. And this is an offshore borough area. And this area is what we use in 2017. So this is a 2022 project, a borough area. It's just a little bit north of that, adjacent to what we used last time. And the construction schedule is expected to between July and uh, August. So this slide shows the typical design of this uh, box renourishment project, very similar to what we just saw for Ava. The ridge along National Seashore, there will be no dune construction because they already have uh, this uh, established dune over there. But along the village of Buxton, we plan to build a dune, and then the field density is uh, higher than along the National Seashore because more sand is needed in front of the village of Buxton. The berm crest is at plus seven feet, and this uh, dune crest is at plus 13, which is uh, six feet above the dry sand beach. So we are not going to build a humongous dune. It's only six feet high. And over the time, sand will add it onto the dune by wind blowing sand onto it. And this slope is a one on three. This is required by fish, uh, by uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service because of the turtle activity there. So we have this one on three 
And from this elevation to this elevation is six feet. So you can do the math depending on the back slope elevation. The base of the dune is between um, uh, 38 feet to 56 feet. That's the base of the dune. And the initial profile adjustment will occur immediately after construction. So that's what people can expect. And for this profiles and adjusted profiles, as well as the Avon adjusted profiles, we kind of exaggerate a low point here. You may have it, you may not have it, depends on the waves that you're going to get after construction. The reason I want to point it to this is that if waves over top this berm and here may have some water, you may see some pounding issue. Don't panic. Your sand is very coarse, which means after a few after a couple of ties, the water will be drained because what the dry sand berm we built is a several feet above mean high water. So under normal conditions, the water accumulated on the beach will be drained in a, within a couple of days. So if you see any pounding area, don't panic. Give it time. The beach will just respond as natural beach, and then they will go back to what you see now. So that is what we propose to do, plan to do. And now let's take a look at what we did in 2017. What experience we accumulate, what lessons we learn. So this is an overview of that uh, 2017 project. The contractor is a Wix Marine, and Wix Marine is another large um, dredging company. And the project length is the same as uh, what we are going to do this time, 2.9 miles. And the nourish volume is uh, twice as much as this time. We propose to do 1.2 million cubic yards. This time, last time, it was 2.6, 2.6 million cubic yards. And because the total volume is higher, so this average fuel density is uh, much higher. And that time, we didn't do the dune construction because the purpose and goals of that project is to bring sand to your system because you had a big deficit of sand. So the purpose of goals is to bring sand there, and we didn't build a dune that time. And it proved to be a good decision. If you have been to uh, Buxton recently, you see that the dry sand beach is um, really pretty much <coughs> no, <coughs> excuse me, no dry sand beach during high tide. Think about if you have a dune, number one, it's already gone. Number two, you would have a lot of scarping issues over the past few years. And this, this is the offshore sand area. And the contractor used two kinds of dredges, not only the hopper dredge, but also they started with a cutter head dredge. And here we can talk something. That is the experience we accumulate and the license we learn. First, the contractor estimated that the construction would only take three months, but it turned out to be four months, five months, and then finally, after eight months, the project was completed. So the first day of pumping occurred on June 21, 2017. So the majority of June was, they used that time to set up their subline. They set up a much longer subline than what our new contractor plans to do this time, because last time they plan to start with a cutter head dredge. So cutter head dredge, you need to set up a subline from the borrow area all the way to the beach, which is two to three miles long. So this time the new contractor 
um, since they are going to use a hopper dredge, so they plan to set up the subline for just uh, one mile long. The longer the subline, it would take a longer time to set up, and you're more weather dependent. And the weather just delay the mobilization procedure and then further delay the construction. And also, if you recall, in September 2017, that was a very unusual year. Four named hurricanes, one after another, occurred within the month. So that's what happened. The contractor didn't pump anything for over 50 days. They estimated to complete the project in three months, but for 50 days, they couldn't pump at all because the sea conditions prevented them from doing any offshore work. So that's why July didn't finish August, and then they extended, extended until February 2018, eight months after the beginning of the project. Finally, they finished it. Good news is that they finished it without any environmental incidents, and within the con within the county's budget, and the total cost of that project is uh, that number eight dollars fifty three cents was lower than the market price back then. It was a very good price, so the price wise is good, but just the construction was long. So what valuable lessons we learn? We learn three valuable lessons there. June, July, and August. <laughs> or yet another word, start early. So that's what we learned, and we want to pass this to the new contractor. Despite all the delays, if you recall, before Christmas 2017, actually it's the December 22nd, nourishment in front of a Boston was completed. So that means the most vulnerable section of NC-12 was protected. And that is so significant because it was completed right in time for this spring Northeasters. And if you were here, you know that Northeaster could have a return period of one of 10 years. That means that Northeaster only happened once every 10 years. So this area was protected. They were close to finish the project. There was really no damage to NC-12 at that time, and really minor damage to the properties. So the project proved Proof is the value um, despite of the delays. There's a, another set of photo. And this is the current condition of a Buxton. Those two area photos were taken in November 2021 after Northeaster. Think about after. During this 2017 project and after the 2017 project, here I listed all the significant weather events that impacted this area. And there are other minor events I didn't list at all. Look at this is September 2017 during, during construction, four named hurricanes. And then Northeaster, hurricane, hurricane again, and then Northeaster. In between this, northeaster, northeaster, winter storms. That's why this is the current condition. Um, our latest survey in August 2021 showed that there is still 25% of nourishment sand remain within this uh, project area from in front of uh, Buxton and um, all the way to National Seashore. So there are still 25%. The reason you don't see it probably is um, near shore or even further offshore building the bar. But the dry sand beach has returned to the pre-nourishment condition in 2016. 
So Avon's condition, um, July 2022, see those hurricanes and the north northeasters impacted Avon as well. That's why Avon experienced accelerated eroding over this past few years. But some good news for you who live uh, in Avon is that between July 2020 and August 2021, actually you have some natural accretion along your project area. So you can tell the beach is uh, healthier. The dry beach is uh, a little bit wider than what we have in July 2020. But you still have a sand deficit south of the pier. That hasn't changed. It just um, conditions slightly improved naturally. Okay, we move to this anticipate construction schedule. This is uh, similar to what um, the county has uh, put on their website, more beach to love. Here, this is today, we are having this uh, public information meeting and a pre-construction meeting with the resource agencies uh, have been scheduled on April 6th. And then the contractor plans to start mobilization in May and uh, the dredge plans to arrive in June in Avon, start Avon first, and then Avon nourishment it's expected to take uh, 40 dredging days, but probably um, for 60 calendar days. So that's the current estimate under normal weather condition. And then by August, if everything goes well as planned and the contractor uh, should be in this uh, demobilization phase and you should, Avon should have received 1 million cubic yards, box 1.2 million cubic yards on your beach by August this year. So between now and May, and even between now and June, when you see sand on the beach, what you're going to see, what are the preparations? Lots of work are behind the scene. You may not be able to see anything, but the contractor and us are working. So we will have a lot of paperwork to do, including the pre-dredging submittals and uh, those uh, surveys. Those surveys are very important. For example, there's a pre-construction beach condition surveys. We have, uh, so far we have two sets of design. One is for permit application. Based on the time once we submitted a permit application, based on the a uh, beach condition at that time. And then we issue a second set of drawings, second set of design based on the condition at the time of bidding. And now after this uh, pre-construction beach condition survey, we will have the third set of drawings to just give it to the contractor so that they can build the beach based on the con condition at construction. So if you see something on that drawing, and this is not the final, this is not what you're going to see on the beach, we will revise this drawing based on the condition before construction. And again, all the drawings, the building drawings and these construction drawings, they, are, they will all be within these permit requirements. So we cannot do what is outside of the permit. For example, we designed the dune along certain section of the beach based on your volume analysis that is in the permit condition. So we cannot add more dunes beyond what we are permitted to do. And those are the preparations. So you may see some survey teams on your um, in front of your house and on the beach. Um, but what you will really see some actions is in this uh, primary staging area. It is at the end of the old lighthouse view, low, old lighthouse road in Buxton. So this area is the primary staging area that a contractor will use. 
what you are going to see, you may you will see dozer, bulldozers, front end loaders, lots of pipes and fuel tanks and other things. And you may see this uh, 35 foot three wheeled giant vehicle. It is a coastal research amphibious buggy. This is a survey equipment and this is very important to measure how much sand the contractor has placed on the beach. And we always re receive a request whether people can climb on it. The answer is no. <laughs> and this is a secondary staging area. It is at the end of uh, Avon. This is the last line of house in Avon. And this is ramp 38. Probably you have used that to go to the beach. But during construction, this area, NPS has already proved the contractor to use this area as their secondary staging area. So you will see again dozers and pipes, not as much as the primary staging area because this is uh, only half acre. Um, but you will see something. If um, once the contract is here, if they do not have, the, if they do not occupy this area, they may leave a safe path for the beach goers as long as they, they think it's safe for people to use that beach access. Um, just watch the sign and see whether that beach access is closed and expect it is closed. I shouldn't promise you it may be open for some days, but just assume it is closed for the full time. Think about you're going to get sand, you're going to get a wider beach, sacrifice beach access for that short period of time. It's completely worth it, right? So here are the two dredges that the contractor plan to use. The first one, Alice Island. She is she is the largest dredge in the America. The capacity is almost 15,000 cubic yards. But um, our experience with this dredge at NextHat is that on the average, the dredge can hold 11,000 cubic yards per load. They don't want to overload it, otherwise the dredge, the draft could be too much and then that could cause trouble. So 11,000 cubic yards per load is their optimal um, amount of sand they can put on this Alice Island. So Alice Island is anticipated to arrive in July and she will work in Buxton and finish Buxton. And another dredge that will arrive early is at Liberty Island. Compared to Alice Island, Liberty Island is a smaller. Good thing is that a smaller dredge, the turnaround time can be much faster. So the maximum load numbers of a dredge like this and the borrow area nearby, it could be the maximum could be as much as 10 loads per day. Think about the 43,000 cubic yards per load. If you finish 10 loads, that dredge one day a good, perfect day could finish 43,000 cubic yards. And Avon, you only need 1 million cubic yards. So if every day is a perfect day, this stretch will take only 20, 25 days to finish it. But you know, again, this is Hatteras Island. So if somebody has the power to call the waves to come down and to have a good months in June and July, and then we're confident that the contractor can finish it really within the time that they estimate. And these two dredges worked together for Next Head in 2019 for their renourishment project. I don't know whether Amount know that number. This dredge together, one day, the maximum volume they deliver is just 4,000 cubic yards short of uh, 100,000 cubic yards. 
That's a perfect day. And after that day, the crew tried to break that record and reach that 100,000 QBRs per day record. But hey, the project was done. They lost their chance. I think now the crew has a chance to break a record this time. So now construction, that's the exciting part. All the preparations, permitting documents, all for this day for construction. And during construction, the contractor, Great Lakes, is the backbone of this project. What we do as engineer or as a county or as residents as you, we got to help them and not to make any delay or distract them. Our goal, every phase of the project, we have a purpose and goals. At this phase, our goal is to help the contractor to finish their job as soon as possible. So this is what we plan to do during construction. Daily, weekly, monthly, we all have a plan. We have been there, done that, so we have a system and trust the county, trust your leader, trust your engineer, trust the contractor. We know what we're doing. Some of them are required by the permit conditions and some are just uh, for this uh, uh, increased production purpose. So we have a daily observation, weekly meeting, monthly payment, and then we have a monitors every day for the environmental impact. And the county will release a tracking map periodically and um, Ms. Hester will give you more details of that. So if you want to know the progress of the construction, of construction the best source is, best place to go is more beach to love. So here I listed some uh, environmental and ecological monitoring, monitoring works that are required by the permits. And then either the contractor, Great Lakes, will do it, or the county has the subcontractors to fulfill those requirements, which include sea turtle monitoring, daytime, and Superintendent Hilux Group will take care of this daytime monitoring. And we have a subcontractor to do the nighttime, and uh, NPS will have a resource protection area the reason I put this there because this uh, protection area may change the schedule. What does a protection area mean? That means if NPS biologist bought American oyster catcher or least turn, they are all endangered and protected species. If they nest on the dune, and then they will have a thousand feet of closure area that the contractor or nobody can get uh, uh, machines near there. So that contractor may have to adjust their schedule. So check that more beach to love. If that happens, we will post that information as soon as uh, we get a firm information from NPS. And then this is uh, something new this time for ecological monitoring for people who cares about this benthic community, and uh, we are going to monitor this benthic community before the project, during the project, and two years after the project to make sure that this kind of uh, nourishment acti activity will not adversely impact the benthic community. So, Construction and the public. I think this is a commissioner couch. <laughs> okay. That's the first day of pumping. That's a historical moment on June 21st, 2017. And then this is the active zone. This is like, nourishment is like any construction zone. When you, when you see a yellow or orange tape and says danger, don't get in, right? You stay away. However, whenever possible, 
the contractor may leave a back shore corridor for beach goers. So you can walk not here, but along this as close to the toe of dune as possible to stay away from the pipes. So whenever it's possible, wherever it's possible, so the back shore corridor will be available. But if there's no beach at all, and then the contractor cannot leave a back door, back shore corridor. So they have to close the whole area. And then people ask this question, what is the active zone? How big is the active zone? Here is the number, about 800 to 1,000 feet. So it varies from day to day. It depends on how fast the construction goes. So it's, uh, let's say, 100, 1,000 feet from the, north, the southern closure, the south, southern closure to the northern closure. This 1,000 feet area is the active construction zone. So only authorized personality can get into that zone. So beachgoers and homeowners cannot get into it. But this zone is uh, moving on the average every 500 feet per day, depending on the contractor's uh, pumping direction. Hypothetically, they are pumping north. So this zone will move north 500 feet every day. So and when they leave this area, they open this re they open this newly nourished area immediately. And the pipes may still be there because they will need the pipe to pump sand, continue to pump sand further north. But they are going to put a ramp over this pipe. Don't climb this pipe. I know people like to challenge themselves to climb the pipe. It's three feet. Pipe is not that high. You can jump over it. However, don't do that. Use the ramp. The contractor will push this ramp every few hundred feet. So for all this is for the safety. You don't know this pipe. There's a slurry going through here. This could be 20 feet per second slurry. So you don't want some leaking and it just it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not fun. Just climb this ramp. And they will open this area as fast as you can. Look at people. Enjoy the new beach and watch this dredge from the distance. And again, this is a back shore corridor. And for Avon, we have Avon Pier. And the contractor Great Lakes has gone through, have, have, has pumped through piers many times. So they are very experienced. Depends on the clearance of the pier, the width, the height, they will have the right equipment and the construction method to go through the pier. Don't worry, they know what they do. Okay. The contractor will try their best to walk around the public. I like this photo because this photo shows literally walking around the public. Somebody find a perfect spot on the beach and didn't want to move. So the contractor has to till the beach around this beach chair. Talking about walking around the public. So, but in the afternoon, he left, so they could, <laughs> he left, so the contractor could till this uh, area. Um, this didn't happen in Deer County. It's not a Hatteras Island, it's in Florida. Okay, I prepared a short video that, is a, that was taken last time during the 2017 Buxton project. And Thank you, Matt, if you can play the video. Just give you, some people have already seen this um, construction, but uh, 
just gave you some feeling of uh, what happened at the discharge point and how how the slurry would flow and what the active construction zone look like. And this is one pumping approaching Buxton. So uh, I was standing at the last, the first, the northernmost motel at that time. You see the dozers were pushing sand. And this is another discharge point. But at that moment, the contractor was using the seaward discharge point. You see how far away the uh, slurry flows. And that wasn't a very clear day, but I can tell you that the water was not, the turbidity was not that high because the sand quality is good. No mud, almost no mud. And in the offshore borough area, and this is a dredge the contractor used. For more information, go to Moore Beach to love. This photo was taken during 2017 as well. Thank you so much, Han Ching. Very, very detailed presentation, a lot of good information in that. Thank you so much, Han Ching. I'm going to ask um, Ahmad if, uh, from our uh, construction uh, folks at Great Lakes if he'll come forward now and make a few comments. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, well, Great Lakes is excited to be here and very uh, thankful for everybody in the room that uh, did all the hard work to get Great Lakes here. We get to come at the end and do all the fun stuff with the big toys, but all the funding and permits and <clears throat> reporting that's required has been done for you know years before we get to show up this summer and uh, work in this community. So safety is our uh, core value at Great Lakes. It's our first priority. Um, <clears throat> we are an incident injury free company, meaning that we ask all of our employees from the CEO down to the um, crew members to um, work safe and go home safe every day to their families. Message for management. GLDD employees are committed to incident injury free work environment from which we return safely to our family's home. At Great Lakes, we hold safety as a value, caring for one another and treating one another with respect and dignity through an open and honest communication. We work safe because we want to rather than we feel we have to. That's important to us. Through this safety culture, you know, management isn't always going to be on the job site. So our crews working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year are working safe because they want to, not because they feel like they have to. This is OSHA's total recordable incident rate. Uh, for an extended period. We had a spike in injuries in 2005 and uh, dedicated to the incident injury free culture. And as you can see over years, this has come down with the last five years, the total recordable incident rate has been sub one or less than one. It's an OSHA rate. Um, the layman's term is for every hundred employees that <clears throat> worked uh, a full year um, when you have an injury, you get a rating of one. So over the la last five years, for every 100 employees, less than one has been injured in what we consider is a high hazard environment that we're constantly managing to avoid. And <clears throat> if you think about this, this red line, if we would have continued that, all of this white space would have been employees that would have been injured over that period. So we're very proud of the, the program and our safety culture. Um, this is last year's safety leading indicators reporting. Um, <clears throat> lagging indicators are things like incidents, injuries. Leading indicators are safety reporting that can help us avoid um, injury. Uh, I'll point out a couple of things briefly here, but proactive reports. We use a system called good catch reporting. So if somebody catches something before it happens, corrects it before there's an incident, a good catch, and they fill a form out. And you can see in 2021, we were up to about 25% to over 2,000 good catches reported for the year. Um, so we do a lot of analysis of our injuries. <clears throat> Historically, we looked at the recordable injuries and corrective actions to avoid those moving forward. With the reduction in injuries, we're able to look at our first aid injuries 
And when we see trends in hand you know, uh, incidents, then we can address that with our crews so we don't lead towards uh, an actual recordable incident. Touch on this quick, we do have a, a COVID-19 policy in place. We're, re we're required to, by the Coast Guard, we're still required to, to wear masks and um, when we're indoors and such, so we follow those policies. We're still um, voluntarily uh, testing all employees before they return to work to avoid um, any impacts to their uh, health and well-being. All right, so just touch on the equipment. It's the Liberty Island, the Ellis, that'll be coming to do the project. Um, the Ellis, as, as stated previously, is 14,800 cubic yards capacity. Um, to put that into a little bit of perspective, every time if she brings 11,000 uh, yards to the beach here, that would be uh, just shy of 1,000 dump trucks of sand that comes every time she comes to the beach. So uh, just a good reduction of impact on your, your roads, I guess. And for the Liberty Island, it's 6,540. So every time she comes, quicker cycle, so more, more loads per day, but it's just shy of 350 dump trucks that they bring each time they come to the, to the site. So when they're out in the borrow area, which we'll touch on trailing suction, hopper dredge, they literally have arms that go on the bottom and they uh, drag those on the bottom, change the sand into a slurry with water and pump it into the hopper. The hopper being essentially uh, a dumpster within the ship that holds the sand and brings it to the pump out facility. Um, in order to support these massive vessels, um, we have what we call the bull gang. It'll be three to four tugboats uh, mobilizing with a derrick barge, a crane on a barge, um, a mooring barge, which is, a, if you look offshore when we're here operating, there's a, a large cube floating out there that has a, a turning gland so the ship can hook up to hoses, and when they move in the sea, the gland moves so they can pump, pump through the fixed pipeline. Um, so we'll have crew boats and, and the, the infamous crab. Uh, no, there are not site visits to the crab, but uh, you can uh, look on YouTube for the videos there. So people get very creative. <clears throat> so shore-based equipment, uh, we'll have five to six bulldozers at times, particularly with the Ellis and the large uh, cubic yards per load. Um, have front-end loaders, fill shacks, mechanic shacks, as you can see here. Um, there's a lot of equipment and there's these zones that are not allowed for the public sh sheerly for safety. We're not trying to uh, try to minimize the impact on, on the local community uh, as much as we can, but this is active zone and um, that's why we close it to avoid that. Uh, we'll have, depending on the time of the project, we'll have anywhere from two to four sublines uh, installed. This this distance actually uh, increases based on the water depth, and we're looking at more of a 5,000 to 6,000 foot um, subline, and then the 500 foot of floating hose. And then all this is what we consider shore pipe is added to the pipeline as we progress down the beach. So project overview, this is just a, a shot of, you can see a dike that's, that's helping the material build up as well as uh, minimizing any uh, turbidity impact there's a pipeline that runs on the bottom of the seafloor out to the cube, and this is a, a dredge hooked up to that, pumping through that. And this is the slurry that you saw in the, the video previously. Um, this is project overview. Our intent is to start in Avon and work our way to Buxton. That has to do with uh, which dredge is available first. We could start with a Avon, but we'd have to wait till August when the Ellis is available. I mean, Buxton. So surely the most efficient and available equipment to start the project as early as possible. Obviously the highlighted weather um, increase in the, in the fall is, is um, smart to be avoided. So this is, this is Avon. <clears throat> There'll be the two pipelines, one of them just north of, of the pier there. Uh, likely start on that pipeline, pump north, and then flip over and, and pump south. Um, Roughly 20, 20 pumping days, so we'll pump north for 10, flip over, and pump south, pending weather and mechanical 
Um, prior to the arrival of the dredge, both of these pipelines are scheduled to be installed. And so the second pipeline, similar amount of quantity, and that'll be located um, in the vicinity of Greenwood uh, Street. <clears throat> and the same thing there, we'll pump north and then flip over and, and tie in on the, on the south for that uh, million cubic yards. And then Buxton, there'll be th three pipelines. Um, while we're digging in June in uh, Avon, the first pipeline for the Ellis, this longer pipeline, will start to be installed. Um, and as we complete the first pipeline in Avon, uh, this northernmost Buxton pipeline will be installed. So depending on dredge schedule, uh, Buxton may see two dredges at the same time. So uh, the total number of dredge days is slightly more, but actual... Um, number of days active on the beach, if depending on the schedule, may be reduced with both the Liberty and the Ellis uh, pumping at the same time. But the same concept here for the Ellis, she'll pump north starting in um, July and then flip over and tie into the south. The Liberty will finish Avon and then start on the northernmost line, pump north and then south. Uh, fortunately, both of these pipelines are in the uh, National Seashore, so hopefully we'll have minimal impact on any any residents. Um, the Ellis line should be installed roughly um, in the, the area of Ocean Drive, uh, depending on surveys and then final quantities and beach design. Um, we have some third party surveyors that help, uh, services that help us with the environment. We have 24 hour uh, endangered species uh, observers on both of the dredges. Um, Sometimes we have trawlers that are deployed and then survey surveyors. Um, just to touch on the, the dredges a little bit here, um, just for you, those of y'all who aren't aware, they are essentially floating factories. They have anywhere from 18 to 22 people on the vessel, half of them working a shift at a time. So there's two 12 hour shifts. So we work, you know, 24 uh, seven. So when you, here the dozers out there it's it's not uh we don't have the the alarm on for fun the the men are out there working collecting the sand to bring it to the beach uh same with the observers they're on the dredge 24 7. uh we we do our training per the permit and the uh contracts to all of our employees about the specific different types of of environmental uh potential impacts and really core message is similar to safety. If you're not sure, stop, tell somebody, we'll get a professional there, call the professional so they can tell us uh, what it is. But we do do some training. So every employee on the job shot should at least know the, the requirements. Um, some of the survey gear, it's all uh, hydrographic surveys and RTK surveys of the, the landward. So you'll see our crews out there um, collecting the data um, and it gets signed off by a licensed um, surveyor provided to the engineer who QCs the data, verifies the volumes, and then we do the, the payment um, monthly. We do very detailed QC, QA procedures for horizontal and uh, vertical tracking of not only the sand that's placed, but of where the equipment is being dredged from. Um, there's three-dimensional tracking for, for all of the dredges, the, um, you know, sailing to and from the borrow area, exactly where uh, X, Y, and Z, how deep we're dredging um, to get the, the sand that's permitted for this job. The very, very detailed, I won't get into any, much of the engineering behind it, but that's kind of a 30,000-foot uh, overview of the project for Great Lakes. Thank you so much, Armand. Appreciate that information. Um, <clears throat> as we wind down, um, uh, Dorothy uh, Hester, our um, public information officer, is going to present a little video here on uh, more beach to love. As Hai Ching uh, mentioned in her comments, uh, this this video and this more beach to love is just uh, we're trying to make our public aware. It's an awareness campaign, and it's just so we can keep everyone informed on a daily basis 
as the progress of the uh, project uh, throughout the uh, whole county and, and the uh, process. So Dorothy's going to show that uh, video now. Oh, you didn't? Oh, okay. She didn't bring the video. I I ain't gonna, we, ain't video. Go, we ain't gonna show you the video. But you can go to our website and see the video. No, I didn't bring the video. I just um, pulled together a few slides. Ha Ching and I met earlier today to talk about um, how we're gonna exchange information because we know how important it is to keep everyone updated um, on the project. Some of you may be aware of More Beach to Love, the awareness campaign, the website. It was a vital tool for communicating for the 2017 projects. And the way this evolved was the towns have some projects. We had the Buxton project, project and we said, hey, we got a lot going on. Um, how you've got guests booking vacations, you've got realty companies trying to let guests know we've got hotels. So many people that want to know what's going on. So we came together and came up with this clever um, More Beach to Love campaign. So what you find there, um, many of you may know, we've just posted the estimated timeline for all of the projects. And um, I'll tell you, the calls have, have been cut back quite a bit just since we posted the timeline. People obviously look into book vacations and trying to figure out when they think construction is going to take place in a particular area. But we also have project maps. Those are Google Maps for each project. And I'll go into that a little bit more. And then we have frequently asked questions. Uh, and we, there's a lot of frequently asked questions. And quite honestly, we're going to add some more. Even after tonight, we're going to add more frequently asked questions because we'd really like for people to be able to go here and have their questions answered. So I'll dive a little deeper into the resources that are here. I mentioned the estimated construction schedules, um, the Google Maps. There's a different map for each project. You can sign up to receive email updates for each particular project. There is a separate list for Buxton and Avon. There's, so you have to sign up for both if you want to know about what's happening with both. We're not going to send a lot of emails it will really be the major milestones. Um, when we find out something's happened, they're changing direction, what, whatever, that's, that's when we're going to send out an email is when something major happens. We have media resources. There's videos there. We'll post the video from this meeting tonight because we know not everybody. We, I think Charlie said we had about 40, or 40 to 50 that were tuning in virtually. I'll, I should probably remind them if they if you if you're tuning in virtually and you have a question submit to dare county pr at darenc.com because we're going to be going to those shortly but the media resources and then i mentioned the frequently asked questions one of the um, features that people really seemed to like in 2017 was being able to use the google map to determine if a particular property is in the project area, and then once construction starts, where they are in relation to where the work is taking place. So basically, you go to the project map, and on a desktop, you'd click on the magnifying glass or go to the search bar on your mobile device, type in the address, and then it's going to pin and show you where that property is in relation to We'll see colors change as construction starts. Right now, if you go to the map, all you see is that project area. But as um, things progress, as an area is completed, it'll turn green, and the actual construction area will be red. So it's, it's a great tool. And people, particularly our visitors, like that feature because they're trying to figure out in relation to where they're going to stay. So we're doing some education and promotion. Um, I think the website is our primary resource. We reached out to OBAR and asked them to do a survey with property managers. And I think we had about 65 responses. And most of the realty companies said, we don't want anything printed. We want to use the URL and send people to the website. Um, so we know that that's the most critical piece of our communications, and we're going to do 
everything possible to keep it updated so that people can go and, and get what they're looking for there. There is a social media kit, so we've put together email banners, some sample posts, um, the graphic for More Beach to Love in case somebody wants to link to it on their website. So we encourage everyone to use that those resources. Um, digital and radio ad placements, we'll be doing some Google ads and um, social media advertising. We think that's probably going to be the most effective. We are um, some of the ra radio hatteras, of course. We're going to, and also Island Free Press are part of our plan. So we wanted to make sure that we were using those those resources that people locally use as well. And then we are printing some rack cards, even though some folks said they didn't want rack cards. We think that's important. We know there are going to be personnel out on the beach. Some of the staff. Um, the park rangers, and some of the hotels and, and other businesses may want those. So we'll have those available, and um, hopefully they'll get distributed. We won't see them on the side of the road. And that's about it. The one thing I didn't cover, I'll go back a little bit, because I wanted to show you there's contact information. I missed that. So ha Ching was saying, send people to More Beach to Love. And um, if someone goes here and can't get their question answered, you can see I'm the contact for Avon and Buxton. So that's my contact information is there. And if you are interested in rack cards or if there's anything we can do from our perspective, even if you have a suggestion for a frequently asked question, reach out because we want to we we want to run an effective campaign and keep people informed. So that's all I have, and I'll. You're gone. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I know we've thrown a lot at you the last hour and a half, but um, at this time, I'm going to ask the county manager if he'll come forward. And if anybody here uh, in the audience has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask Bobby those. And if anybody virtually, um, once again, um, if you have if you have a question, um, please uh, uh, send that to us now. And uh, remember, it's Dare County PR at DareNC.com. So we'll try to answer anything virtually, or if anybody here in the audience has any questions, uh, I'll turn it over to the county manager. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm not going to prolong this, but if you have questions after all this, please raise your hand. When you do, Dorothy will bring you a microphone and you'll ask your question. I'll try to answer it if I can't. I have CSE and all their staff here. I have my staff here, and somehow we'll get you an answer. And if none of us can answer it, then Dorothy will get some contact information and we'll follow up with you with an answer tomorrow. So any questions tonight? Thanks. My name's Paul Linden. I have a place up in Avon. Um, we received a, uh, a letter for uh, easement, beach nourishment easement. Um, just wondering, uh, I'm not sure if everybody received those uh, along the coast there, but how, what is the purpose of that? Uh, the beach nourishment easement is the easement that gives us the authority to, to go on the beach. There's an area between where the park service on some properties, and not on all properties, from where the park service owns to where you own that we may have to put sand on and we can't just go dump sand on your property without your permission. Um, our issue is it takes a long time to get those easements. You heard Hai Ching say they're going to do some survey work. So until they do that work, we don't really know where that break is. So we may ask you for an easement and when the survey is done, we find that actually the Park Service lines in a place where we might not have needed that easement, but we can't wait till May to start collecting the easements because we couldn't start the project then. So we've sent out for the easements. Um, we've had pretty good response. I think we've got eight or 10 that we don't have that we need, um, but for the most part, that's what it's for. Now the easement doesn't allow anyone to go through your yard or use your yard for access or any of those kinds of things. If you read the legal, gobbledygook, and I admit I wrote it, it's legal gobbledygook, but that's how you have to do it. Um, it. It says that our easement starts at the toe of the dune or the dune or the 
first line of stable vegetation. So, and from there, it works its way east. And so what's basically saying is to the extent that you have property that from erosion that's now not in the park and we have to start at the base of that dune, we can start there and work eastward to put sand on a beach to widen that beach in front of your house. But beyond that, we don't have any rights to your property. Nothing on the west side of the dune. Uh, um, everything's on the east side of the dune. Can't cross your property, can't come in your yard, can't go down your driveway, none of those things. It's all on the beach side of the dune. Thank you. And I guess while I have the mic, uh, i ask one more. The, um, will, the con will there be construction traffic from ramp 38 where they're staging equipment uh, to the work zone? Will that happen on a daily basis or...? Um, it'll happen, I don't, daily might be too much, but it'll be, it'll happen as often as they need to. And they've got to move their crews in and out, so there'll definitely be vehicles daily going through there. Whether there'll be a bulldozer going the length of that property daily would depend on, you know, where they are, what they have to do. So there will be activity. Other questions? Hi, my name's uh, Jim Hartshorn. Uh, I've been up to Manu, and we talked uh, at the last uh, Beach Nourishment, and uh, uh, my big thought is uh, dunes are extremely important. Uh, I have a degree in geology. I've had a house in Buxton uh, on the beach there since 93 and first started coming here in 73. So I've had a lot of uh, time at the beach, and, uh, and I just think that the dune that we've built ourselves has, has helped, but of course those are all gone in Buxton now. Uh, the storms have, uh, have taken those away. Uh, one thing I do see right now that uh, the more sand, the better. I know we've contracted for so many dollars and so many cubic yards of sand. And if you've been to the Buxton Beach uh, here in the past two, three weeks, we've had a very nice bar that has come in. And uh, if you go there at low tide, there's people out there probably as far as what the nourishment would go. Has much thought been given to... Uh, are we going to pump as many cubic yards as the dollars will allow us to do, even though there's some natural sand that has come in? If you can understand what my question yes. is, I, I, the more sand, the better to me. And of course, I, I know that we have, uh, Hai Ching has uh, disarmed me that she can only build a six foot tall dune, and I'll, I'll have to respect that, and that's what the permit says. Uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that some forethought is given to, to pump as many cubic yards as we possibly can so it could last longer certainly than the, the 2017 one and hopefully uh, you know th this will last a longer time and, I, and I'm very appreciative that the county has uh, has put together after five years after the first one didn't work real well and has come back as you said you would I, I didn't know if I believed it but uh, you've come back and I'm, I'm very appreciative that that is happening but uh, I just wonder if there's any thought processes Anybody looked at that uh, as far as what's there now in Buxton and are we going to keep on pumping as many cubic yards as what we've contracted for? And not, I hope that we do. I'm not looking to save uh, half a million dollars and pump less. So, okay, that's, that's my question. Thank you. No, we're not going to be trying to cut the project short to save money. We've, we've budgeted this money and we're going to pump every cubic yard of sand that the budget will allow us to pump. And so to the extent the beach has improved, then good for us. That means we, we're going to get some more time out of it uh, than we anticipated. Uh, one thing I do have to say, I can't help it, is you mentioned it wasn't successful or it didn't do what we thought. The project was truly successful for what we were doing. Remember the first thing, the first purpose of that project is to protect Highway 12. That is the only way we can get it permitted. And Highway 12 has not been damaged or destroyed in the last five years. Uh, Whereas in Buxton, I mean, in Rodanthe, we couldn't have said that some years ago. So we're trying to avoid Buxton being what Rodanthe was. And that, to that extent and for that purpose, it has been a huge success. And we'll continue to do it on these five-year intervals for that reason. Yeah, I'm happy, happy that you're coming back. And that's a uh, sure. that's great testament. And the, the dollars are there. And that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but, yeah, let's pump as many cubic yards as what we've got the dollars to do, so thank you. Other questions? Any other questions in the room? 
I don't see any other hands, so Dorothy, I don't, how are you going to get me the... I've got some questions, okay, great. and I'm going to probably have to put on my readers. Um, Mr. Peterson, I haven't vetted all of these, so some of them may be a little redundant, Bobby. Um, will a, a dune be placed in the location? I think we covered that with Hatching. What width will the beach be on completion of beach nourishment? And will seagrass sea oats be planted? We've covered some of it, but... Uh, seagrass sea oats will be planted. What, I don't remember what the width is going to be approximately in Buxton. Is 100 feet? But um, when, the, when they pull out of here after it's finished, it'll be 100 feet. And then it will we'll equilibrate and shrink some after that. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Lyons is asking if there will be an impartial assessment or if it will be peer-reviewed re, peer following the project. I'm not sure if I know what his question is. Um, we gauge success, as I just described, is our goal is to protect the highway. And so if the highway is protected, then it's been a successful project. There is science going on in these Permits, as, as Hai Ching explained, I think in our permits we're required to do uh, benthic monitoring for a number of years, and, and that has to be done as a part of the a permitting process. Uh, we also have to do the survey work to determine how much sand remains in the project. We have to do that often because that's the only way we can get our FEMA reimbursement should we have a, a storm. So all of that work will be done. All that work has always been done. Um, and so, again, I'm not sure what he's talking about peer review. Okay, and um, plans to are there plans to rebuild the walkway or stairs over the dunes? Does the county have plans to rebuild the walkway or stairs over the dunes? That's from Miss McKay. Yeah, the the walkway and the walkovers are private property. I mean, for the most part, they're not. We don't own them. Uh, the private property owners put them there, and so if they need to build them back, they have they can build them back, but they have to get their permits from the park service and from the county to do that. Okay. I was just looking to see if we've answered most of these questions. Some of these were about dunes, and I, but I think we've covered that. If not, I can follow up with him separately, specifically about that. Um, there, there was a question about if consideration was given to refurbishing the groin system um, because it's a, a hazard to beach users, and if not, why, why not? Um, the answer is there was consideration to that, and our engineers and consultants pushed hard for us to try to do that. Um, we went to at least one and maybe more scoping meetings with the idea of trying to do that, uh, but the net result was the state, under the rules that we have in this state where you cannot put hardened structures on the beach, and in the state of deterioration that was in, they considered it a, a rebuild. They would not have permitted that. They will not permit it. And we were afraid that if we got bogged down in litigation and fighting with them over rebuilding uh, those structures, that we would slow down the process and then our goal of protecting Highway 12 would be lost because we were fighting battles over something uh, that we may not even be able to win. And even assuming we could get past state requirements, we still have to work out something with the Department of Interior because they're the downshore people who would most likely be harmed by that groin and whether they would even allow it or not becomes yet another issue. And so the issues involved and the timing it would take led us to, to take that out of our project and move forward with the project uh, so we could get this thing done timely. Okay, and this, these questions were on behalf of the Avon Property Owners Association. We've covered some of them, but I, I'm, I'm going to go through them. And just how will the Avon project be staged or phased? In other words, can you cover how the beach section closures will unfold over the project duration? Do you have anything to add, ha Ching, with what? How much of the, yeah, about 800 to 1,000 feet of beach closure on a daily basis. Okay. 
So, but the, if, you're, if someone's looking to, to know now when we're going to be in front of what house or what area of houses, I don't know that we can tell them we that know, yet. Yeah. As we know that, we'll post it and they can get that information. <laughs> um, well, again, we've talked about that. We just talked about how large the closure area would be. And he has a concern about trash collection, but I'll connect him with maybe Haching and... And then I'm going to look at what's come in. Those came in. Bear with me. I think I need to get away from that. Okay. Um, this is from Larry regarding ramp 38. What's that? Okay. Ramp 38. Um, will ramp 38 remain open during construction? You said no. For the most part, assume that it will not, okay? The stretches of beach being nourished are areas that typically host hundreds of sea turtle nests during the nourishment period. What's the plan to relocate these nests? Is it a similar plan to the 2017 project? where turtle nest monitors are utilized. I think you answered yes. that, and the answer yes, was did. yes. Um, one last question. After the nourishment project is completed, will Avon Oceanfront homeowners located on Ocean View Drive be allowed to push the dunes currently behind the homes further back onto the beach, or will those dunes be addressed during the project? The future beach pushes with dunes are a function of two things. One is a function of park service permitting that they have, and the second is the CAMA permitting. If, if there are CAMA permits available and they're not doing anything to damage the new beach and, and they can get those two permits, then I would think they might be able to do that. But I can't tell you yes or no without them having to go through those processes. That's all we have. Okay. That's all the questions. Any questions? Any other questions in here? All right. With that said, thank you all for coming.